Yeah. All right. Well, we are uh, here late on a, on a Saturday night with uh, with Mark Horn, and uh, we are. This is the inaugural uh, City of God blog. Um, I guess video video blog, and we're going to be doing it on pedo baptism or or infant baptism. And uh, we're here with uh, with Mark Horn. Uh, he's written an excellent book called um, Why Baptize Babies. And we'll have all the web links up to his to his website and all the different books that he's published. In particular, uh, he's written a biography of J.R.R. Tolkien, and he's also written on a commentary on um, the Gospel of Mark, as well as this book on baptism. So we are uh, delighted to to have him here um, this evening. And um, yeah, so let's just get started. I just wanted to ask you, Mark, um, how did you arrive at becoming a pedo Baptist or an infant Baptist? How did this um, how did this happen? At least in our context here in Canada, it definitely is a it's a minority position. So, how would you answer that? Well, it was definitely a minority position in my background. I was raised Baptist um, and was a believer in, um, I guess, believers' baptism um, for the first probably. I don't know. It depends on when I made the transition. It's kind of a distant memory, but 17 years of my life easily. Um, so I was raised as a Baptist. My parents were missionaries uh, for um, <coughs> the Interior Mission uh, in Liberia, West Africa, and they, everyone around me was a Baptist. Um, autobiographically, what happened is, um, in my teen years, I was in an interdenom- interdenominational context because we, um, well, my dad had a job for uh, GTE Sylvania, which had a military contract, so I was in a military base in Kwajalein, Marshall Islands. Okay. And... Um, there were a lot of civilians there, but it, and um, but we had kind of a chaplaincy kind of arrangement, and um, my so what happened is all the all the, I mean all the Protestants were basically grouped together, you know that kind of situation yeah. where the um, the cross at the front of the chapel you could turn it around and you had Jesus there without his armpits hanging down, so the Catholics could just reverse the cross and have a crucifix that okay, kind of thing. Yeah, so, yeah. It, so all those Protestants were shoved together, and I happened to get probably by his own conspiracy the P, the one PCA guy, um, Presbyterian Church in America person who had ever come into my universe decided to, to volunteer to teach high school Sunday school. Okay, all right. So, now that's how it started. Um, by the time I graduated from college, I was convinced Pato, uh Baptist. Yeah. Um, you know, I cannot tell you exactly when. I was doing a lot of reading and a lot of thinking about a lot of issues through college. I um, was a convinced predestinarian you know, what you call Calvinist by the time I went to um, college, which, by the way, was a Wesleyan Armenian college. Um, okay. What college was that? Funny how the Houghton College in Western New York. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so, um, you know, that's, I got, I kind of had, I'd already chosen that college before I went and underwent my, my, what, proselytization, my ideological conversion, what do you want to right. call it? Anyway, yeah. um, so sometime in my college years, I became a convinced pedo baptist uh, specifically, probably reading um, the works of people like uh, Gary North and Jim Jordan, okay. uh, mainly, and a little and David Shelton. Um, I think specifically reading Jim Jordan on the sociology of the church, and um, a book called The Reconstruction of the Church, which is a collection of essays, uh, really influenced me in that direction, and, and probably was what set my. I mean, that that probably is the reason because it really is about you know understanding the church as an institutional body. And us having an institutional identity as, a, as disciples of Jesus. Okay, all right. Okay, good stuff. Um, now, let's assume that there's going to be somebody uh, listening to this um, this video blog or whatever you whatever you call it. And let's say that they're and they go to a Baptist church or a Christian Missionary Alliance church. They've never encountered any real arguments for um, infant baptism, and specifically are kind of baffled at the fact that a Protestant. Um, you know, would would believe this. Um, how would you go about, um, you know, explaining your belief in infant baptism? I know you're kind of you're gonna have to summarize, you know, an an entire book. Uh, but you know, if you had to give like a, you know, a five minute kind of Twitter, some obviously less than five minutes, but like a quick kind of overview. What uh, what do you think you'd say? Like, where would you start? Well, I think I'd start with the fact that the church is supposed to include children. And you include children as believers, regard them as believers, treat them as believers. And in fact, um, from the beginning, uh, the children were included in uh, the covenant meals. They were um, welcome to the table of God's people. Um, you know, at one point, 
Pharaoh offered to let Moses go into the wilderness and um, and worship the Lord as long as he left his children behind. And he said, no, our little ones have to come with us. Mm. And God wants the little ones there. So in some sense, they're supposed to become, they are part of the church. Now, but once you say that, I mean, you look at the passages, and obviously baptism is a kind of entrance, a ritual, formal introduction into the church. And so the question is, well, why would you wait on that? What, what are you waiting for? And so okay. I would say, you know, the Great Commission would be my primary tool, is that we're supposed to disciple all nations, including our children, and that begins with baptism. Hmm. And so, you know, now that's that's... What you should be hearing here is a kind of traditional argument from covenant and households and all that, but I, I, I think the data could be a little bit more strongly made if we talked about um, how children belong at the table, huh? how children belong in God's fellowship meals with their parents, with their believing parents. Okay, all right. And um, in any case, um, what, once, you, once you see that, um, once you see that pattern, the question is what other pattern could there be? Because... Um, what you don't see in the New Testament or the Old is this huge kind of under this huge um, question and answers about when children's profession of faith can be taken seriously, when it's safe to teach them the Lord's Prayer, to pray it with them, when you know that's a prayer for disciples, um, how long do we wait, how do we have a children's ministry, all of that stuff is just bypassed. Um, it, it's just not the culture of the New Testament, it's not the culture of the Bible at all. And so my question would be, what other practice could possibly be biblical? Hmm. Maybe that's putting it too strongly, but that's, okay. that's how I'm tempted to go. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, that's good. So I, I guess for you, you would see this issue kind of tied up with the Pado communion issue uh, as well, the two kind of going together then, in one sense. I think they do. I think it's, I've always found it easier to convince Baptists to stop being Baptists in the, in, with the Pado communion argument. Always. That's interesting. Okay. That's I mean, for one thing, it's it's a lot easier. Now, I had the privilege at one point of actually, um, um, I actually pastored out of bounds once, and it was a paid communion church. Okay. And um, so we had children at the table, and um, so it was with Presbyterian's permission, and everything. It was a different presbytery, but uh, what I was going to say about that is we had people coming, and um, you know, they had a child who was um, not baptized, but who they obviously regard as a Christian. Well, in a normal context, what difference would there be? What difference would it make if you're baptized? Virtually none. But if you're having weekly communion, yeah. and that seven-year-old sees all the four-year-olds taking communion, <coughs> then it becomes obvious that we should get this person also fully engaged. Sure. Um, you know, if you if you're that's that's another thing is in a, it's not just a paid communion context. It's also just th- seeing communion as actually being something significant and part of the regular worship of the church. Yeah. Because um, that really sets a distinction between who's in and who's out. Hmm. So it, you Great. see it every okay. week. Yeah, yeah. So okay. um, in this case, it just made it just helped them make the jump. They already they already knew this kid was a Christian. I didn't even convince them of pedo baptism right away. I just said, look, obviously you regard your son as a, as a Christian, so let's just do it right. Hmm. So it wasn't really even pedo baptism. But the point is, it, the fact of ongoing weekly communion and young child communion. Um, in this case, full-blown paid, paid communion, this made the issues clear. Yeah. It gave them a completely different context for considering all these issues than they'd ever had before, and it was much more persuasive to them. Okay, that's okay. That's good. Now, I guess to bring it, um, I, I mean, for me, for me personally, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pedo Baptist who's possibly now, you know, going to be attending a, um, you know, a Baptist church for, you know, for various reasons. But I think the thing that kind of brought this whole issue, you know, back into the the forefront uh, was, you know, I just became a dad a, uh, a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, this has obviously made the whole pedo baptism uh, question really pressing for uh, my wife and I. So we're going to have our little girl, uh, we're going to have her baptized over the next couple of weeks. But what I was really um, struck by in your book, um, you know, you mentioned about how Christian parents are given very specific promises by God to their children. And, uh, you know, to go over just really quickly, people watching this can, you know, can look up these references themselves. But, you know, there's a promise from Genesis that uh, God will be their God. <clears throat> there's a promise from Psalm 103.17 that, um, that God's righteousness will be given to them. And that uh, in Isaiah 59.21 that um, God's spirit won't leave them. So I just, you know, I guess... 
I was wondering if you um, wouldn't mind explaining this kind of perspective a little more, because I, I think for a, a Baptist hearing this, or a Credo Baptist, I mean, this is just such a foreign argument, any notion of any promises being given to parents uh, for their children. So if you just uh, wouldn't mind elaborating on that, that would be um, that would be great. Well, like, how would you counsel me if I was worried, like, you know, I don't know how this little girl's going to turn out. Like, you know, what, what pastoral counsel, you know, could you offer me? Well, Keith, I mean, I think part of the problem here is um, what we're looking for, and this ties into another side of Calvinism, is we're looking for evidence of definite, like, eternal election, election to resurrection glory. Do we have kind of an absolute promise that all our children are absolutely predestined for heaven? I mean, you know I'm not saying that. That's, that's yeah, yeah. not oh, yeah. the case. The Bible... So, but, but I think the question you're asking actually gets confused with the other question. Okay. So what I want to say is the kind of confidence I want to have us to have about our children is the same kind of confidence we have about professing believers of any age. Okay. All right? There is a sense in which, I mean, I've done this. I do this with my children. I pray they'll persevere. I pray. And behind that prayer, you know, inside of uh, what you want to, I guess what we call the, um, the Calvinist mechanics, inside that prayer is a prayer that they're truly regenerate and all that. I mean, that, yeah. that, that comes to mind if I, if I decide to use that kind of conceptual <laughs> apparatus. That's fine. But the bottom line is I can pray that for my wife. I can pray that for my parents who raised me in the faith. I can pray it for myself. Lord, give me a heart that follows after you. You know, Lord, never let me wander away. You know, um, if what's that? Uh, oh, sacred head. If I failing be, let me never, never outlive my love for thee. Mm-hmm. You know, so there is a kind of um. There, there is a kind of issue where you know you are, you do realize that faith is expected. Faith is required for people to be saved, and that can, re- and a lack of faith can reveal itself in sort of surprising ways sometimes. Yeah, and I think that happened with Esau, for example. Maybe not. Maybe he converted into his life, but he was just saying early on it happened. Um, but the point is, again. You don't give what we should not be doing is we should not be putting children under more doubt than we do adult professing believers. Okay. okay. That, that's that, so. Let's put it that way. Yeah. We should not be tripping them up with second guessing their motives, suspicious of their of their of their sincerity. We, we actually know in many ways children are actually more spontaneous, sincere than we'll ever be. Right. I mean, yeah. you, you grow up to be you grow up to be a cynic, right? You learn enough to fake it. So, yeah. um, I mean, now there's other sides to that, but I'm just saying. We should not, I mean, step back. I guess what I'm saying is behind the questions I often find of people wondering if their children are saved is an actual double standard where their children are under a more rigorous a more rigorous standard than they would put themselves under. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, and I, I think that that's got to end. I think we've got to say our children are Christians. They are addressed by God as his children. Hmm. Um. Right. But yeah, there is there. Does that mean they're one hundred percent? Every single one is elect, predestined for heaven. That we don't actually know that in some kind of mathematical certainty, but we live and encourage them as believers, and that is what saving faith will respond to. Hmm. Those encouragements. Okay. Unfortunately, so you know, in other words, if a if a child of a, if a in a Pado Baptist family does apostatize, it will be because partly they don't believe what they're told. Right, and okay. then it's it's kind of like the um the tenant who you know said I knew you're a hard master, and he says well, let it be according to your own words. Okay. Uh, so I mean I don't I'm not by the way I'm not saying that's the interpretation of that parable or anything. Yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. saying that's, that's a, that analogy. Just use it as an analogy that comes to mind. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. Great. Well. Um. You know, m- moving on. Uh, I think that um. Let's try and put this light on here. <clears throat> Moving on, I think one of the, um, I know in some of the communities that, that I'm a part of, I know in, in, in Toronto there's been a, seems to be a kind of a resurgence of, uh, of reformed uh, Christianity, and a lot of this is kind of connected to the Gospel Coalition and this young, restless reform movement. Not a lot of um, Pado baptists in, in the mix here. We've got a, a Tim Keller church um, a church plant that's kind of planting in the city, but you know, predominantly this movement is uh, is Baptistic, and I know that everyone was talking about. Uh, there was an article on the Gospel Coalition website uh, a few weeks ago by <clears throat> Gavin Ortland, uh, who used to be a Pado Baptist. He's now a Credo Baptist, <clears throat> and he he made this really kind of interesting argument. And I just 
you know, wanted to know how you'd respond to it. He said that one of the reasons why he's no longer a, a, a pedo Baptist anymore is because we don't baptize uh, grandkids. You know, he would talk about how in the old covenant, you know, even if you had a parents who were faithless, um, their children would still be um, would still be circumcised regardless of the faith of their <clears throat> of their of their parents. You know, but now obviously, you know, kind of the Presbyterian you know, line of reasoning would say that, well, we only baptize the children of believing, you know, parents. Um, and yeah, so I was just wondering, I how, am, how would you respond to this? Like, are, are you know, as a I don't believe it. Okay, what do you, what do you mean? About what? You wouldn't, but you wouldn't circumcise the kids if they're still under their parents, and their parents apostatized. That wouldn't happen. I disagree with them to- totally. Okay, all right. So you'd say, what if it I mean, was... look, and it... In Israel, it would mean an execution, so that would be that. But um, so maybe okay. the kids would get uh, get new parents. But I mean, let's say they left Israel, then there would be a moot point. They would not circumcise their kids, and it would just be done. Now, would they be obligated in some way to return? Um, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, as far as I know, I mean, my view of it is that Moses was the one who got attacked when he came back with uncircumcised kids. That's somewhat debatable. Okay. Probably half, most of my readers are not going to know why I just brought that up, but it, it seems somehow related. I mean, what's his text that says that, uh, that, that he thinks that grandkids are circumcised irrespective of whether or not their parents are faithful? I, I just don't agree with it. I think that's a myth. I don't believe him. I'm trying to see what... Um, no. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess he would see, you know, maybe he's defining... Um, maybe he's defining his terms differently. In term, instead of just outright apostasy, just kind of a nominal... You know, nominal Jew. Um, you know, not. You know, I, I, so how do we know that God's not more merciful and more um, receptive to those nominal people than we are? I've never quite understood. I mean, it depends on what you mean by nominal. Okay. I mean, nominal can mean something like they're not really Christians. It can also mean they didn't convert the same way I did. I, I just sure. Okay. I, I I'm not gonna. I have a hard time determining that issue on that basis. Um. I will say this. I, I do think, like, in the ancient world, if you bought a slave, he didn't even understand Hebrew yet, you would circumcise him. So that is, that is, and I wouldn't say that applies the same way. I mean, basically, the, they lived in an area where they believed in gods, and they understood if they were brought into the household of a certain god, they were under that dominion. Um, probably the Hebrews were alone in being resistant to that and refusing to depart from their gods when they were enslaved, or hopefully they were, if they were, yeah. you know, should have been faithful. But... I don't think you ever baptize someone you know as an unbeliever. Right. Okay, for children you don't know that. But for adults, like if you had like I would not recommend if if you had a, if you if a guy converted and he had a teenage daughter who was not con- who did not believe the gospel and never heard it before and you know this is something dad was into, I would not say you baptize her. Sure, okay. And I, I don't and I mean you know how parental authority and culture worked in the Old Testament might have I might have done it the opposite way. Of course, as a woman, she wouldn't get circumcised. But you know what I'm saying. Um, But, you know, we live in the modern atheistic age. If people are unbelievers, you don't baptize them. I mean, to baptize them would be... You don't baptize someone who you would have to immediately excommunicate. That's kind of my work, my, my, my view on this. Now... Okay. I guess someone can insist that the Old Testament worked differently, but I'm not sure that why it worked differently is really that telling. Because I okay. think people were a lot more willing to understand... <laughs> God's dominion in a, in a little bit in a way that would cause them to be discipled at that point. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, no, it's good. But that's I don't good. think I don't. But I, the grandchildren thing, I just don't. I just don't agree. I mean, I'm, I'm bringing yeah. up this other thing as kind of a close approximation of what might be an argument. But yeah, so you're saying that you know. if they were if they were apostate, they either would have incurred, um, you know, the sanctions of the Mosaic Covenant being executed, or they would have been exiled from the community. You know, so the notion of yeah. them being okay, that's good. Now, I, think now, I mean, the, the, there's one other thing, by the way. Since the covenant of circumcision was with Abraham, not with Gentile believers, there is a sense in which people who realize that they had that heritage could come back to Israel, get circumcised, and start over. But that's because of the strangeness of the um, of the call of Israel among the nations. That's not quite the same as what we have now. So I guess, in a sense, there'd be a special onus on anyone who is a physical descendant of Israel to be circumcised once he became a believer again. Mm-hmm. But you still you're still not going to circumcise the children just because they're grandchildren, whether or not they're believers or not. I, I just don't see that. 
Okay, that's good. Um, Probably complicated this too much. Sorry. No, no, it's good. It's good. It's it, uh, you know I'm hoping this is this is going to be a, like a great resource um, for people. I mean, I, well, I hope so too. But and I'm sort of complicated. But I think one of the problems here is that we basically view everyone in Israel as a believer, and all the Gentiles as unbelievers, and that's just not true. There's plenty of uncircumcised, justified believers in the Old Testament. So sure. a lot of the times when we make these transitions, these equations between Old Testament and New. We're actually comparing apples and oranges. Hmm. Um, all right, well, let's let's move on. I'm, Good. I'm okay. Well, I think throwing you know, enough chaff in the air here. Yeah. <laughs> in in you know in talking to uh, you know friends who are you know Reformed Baptists, I think really the the key argument for them uh, you know comes from you know Jeremiah thirty one, and and how Jeremiah thirty one is is used by the author of you know say Hebrews and in, in Hebrews chapter eight. Um, and I was I was trying to, you know, zero in on this, and I, I think that one of the key things, <clears throat> you know, that they'll say is that the nature of the new covenant uh, is that it's unbreakable. So uh, you know, all members of the new covenant have been regenerated; they're faithful Christians. And, and I know in your in your book, why baptize babies? You seek to show that um, that the opposite is true; that the new covenant is breakable in a sense; that not all members uh, of the new covenant have been regenerated. Um, so I was just curious, you know, how would you interpret um, Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-two, and the following? I'll just read a, a couple of verses, um, and, th- and this is cited in uh, in the book of Hebrews, chapter eight. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. And then he goes on to say that. He's going to put their law <clears throat> within his people. He's going to write it on their hearts, and he's going to be their God, and they shall be um, his people. So it seems that one of the reasons for the new covenant has to do with the breakability um, of the of the old covenant, at least you know for these these authors that are arguing uh, for the baptistic perspective. Um, so you know it sounds like a, a plausible argument for uh, for credo baptism. You know this nature of this this change in the in the covenants. You know how would you uh, how would you respond to that? What do you think? Um, I would just say that if you're going to get an unbreakable covenant out of the book of Hebrews, you're reading a different book than I am. Okay. I mean, it's also in Hebrews 10. I didn't know I was in Hebrews. I've got it in Hebrews 10 right in front of me, and it goes on there about, you know, for if we go on sitting willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, um, what does it say? This is right after it quotes that passage, or part of it, which is sure. already done in Hebrews 8. It quotes it again in Hebrews 10. Um there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment, a fear of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more worse punishment do you think he will de- will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? By the way, you know, that's funny. Um, you know, this is my memory. I was reading, um, you know, Death of Death by John Owen, and he right. uses all these terms where... Uh, you know, dying to sanctify them by their blood proves on limited atonement. And, you know, I believe in limited atonement. I just don't believe in bad arguments for limited atonement. And he completely leaves this one out, and then he discounts it later as a completely Jewish, lowbrow, kind of low-information, you know, theology response to Jews and not having any applicability. It's not the way the language should really work. And it's just weird. Um, look, the answer to your question, in one sense, is I haven't done a big study of Jeremiah. I am yeah. not sure everything that's going on. I don't think it's what evangelicals think. Sure. And I'll get to that in a minute. But whatever it means, it's in Hebrews, and Hebrews does not give you this unbreakable covenant. Mm-hmm. Um, it does not, for that means individuals can't apostatize. Um, it, it, Hebrews says, look, I don't have to read. I mean, anyone can read Hebrews at their leisure and see that I am right. This is not proving that the covenant can never be broken. It's saying you really had better not because things will be a lot worse for you than they were before. Okay. So I, I don't understand the confidence. Also, I mean, the other thing about this is that, you know, Jeremiah is saying that once, you know, this this the, the true salvation, the true knowledge of God was restricted, now it's going to break forth everywhere. It's, it's not an application to say, and therefore only a few people in the church are really in the covenant, or a few, only only a few of us are really in. I mean, it seems to me you're, you're looking for, an, re, you know, reducing the number of people regarded as Christians, it seems like an odd application for that kind of, that sure. kind of passage. Hmm. And that, that seems to be what's going on. Um, finally, you know, I, 
you know, I, I think contextually, um, everything points to Christ, so everything is prophecy of the New Testament. The, the exodus from Egypt is really fulfilled in Jesus and the cross and the church. And so is what happens to Jeremiah, but my opinion is that Jeremiah is referring mainly to return from exile. Um, now, I can't defend that. I mean, I mean here, in, in the time we've yeah, got, sure. without having a copious study and notes, but I've never been really impressed by thinking that Jeremiah is going directly straight, you know, no stops to um, Christ and the church in his prophecy. I, in context, in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, they're referring back to Deuteronomy 30, which is a promise that they will get new hearts when they are brought back from the land from the exile. <coughs> Okay. And it's true, you know, when Jesus came to them, he never had to tell them to stop worshiping in high places. Right. Maybe the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman being the one exception, but he didn't have to tell them to stop secretly, you know, worshiping these gods in, in these in their houses and all that stuff, or or talk about the um the dog, you know, the prostitutes yeah. that were doing cultic ceremonies. They, they were they were through with that. They'd come up with a whole new level of sinning. Um, okay. You know, and a whole new level of judgment with demons all over the place. That's interesting. So. You know, I there's, there's, a, there's a whole conversation here about how we're reading this, those passages that we should have and that I'm just alluding yeah. to. So that's fascinating. But going so back, so going like back, a, my my yeah. my stopgap is Hebrews does not support that interpretation. So sure. it's just about as far as that practical application about apostasy yeah. and about who's in the covenant. Hmm. Sorry, interrupt. What were you gonna say? No, it's just, it's fascinating. So there's you know there's initial fulfillment as the Jews are seated back into the land. Um. And then, I mean, are you are you saying that there's like a progressive fulfillment through time? Like there's, you know, especially if it has a post-millennial tinge to it, that eventually there'll come a place in human history where, you know, where this will be, you know, fully actualized. But we're kind of in a in a place between the times of that further oh. Uh, fulfillment. Oh, so you're, yeah, I don't, yeah, that's 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 a good question because some of these things do pro, do, pro, you know, all prophecies are worldwide. Conversion eventually, yeah. if you're post millennialist, that would be a prophecy that would go directly in the future, but it kind of right. happened in seat form already, right? Yeah. I mean, after all, when in Acts, the apostles, when the apostles go from synagogue to synagogue internationally, that's nothing that David or Solomon accomplished. That's stuff that happened after the return from exile, hmm. which didn't involve a return, also involved, you know, revival and worldwide spread of, of the true knowledge of God yeah. all over the world before it became apostate, and then you had a lot of magicians and that kind of thing. <coughs> um, that's who Paul has some conflicts with. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's some of that. But, I mean, basically what I'm, I'm also saying is that, as I see it, the events of Israel's history are themselves prophecies. For example, that the Exodus is a prophecy of the of the exile. So when, when um, uh, who, out of Egypt, they called my son. Right. That's a reference back to... Um, Israel coming out All right, of Egypt. Now, speaking of the differences between baptism and circumcision, I know that um, there's a really, really popular article uh, that came out from the from the Credo Baptist side. There's a there's a prof, uh, Stephen Welm. He used to be a professor at Toronto Baptist Seminary, and he's a professor now at Southern Baptist. And he he wrote this article on the um, kind of the differences between the between the covenants. And um, and in this article, he was speaking about the differences between baptism and, and circumcision. And uh, he says this, uh, just wondering, you know, how I'd respond to this. Baptism is not a sign of physical descent, uh, nor is it a sign that anticipates gospel realities. Rather, it is a sign that signifies a believer's union with Christ that's already happened and all the benefits that are entailed uh, by that union. Um, so just curious, do you think that that's an accurate uh, characterization of, of these sacraments? And, and if not, you know, where do you think it goes wrong? Well, first of all, baptism is an actual induction into the visible church. Um, you know, when, when people are baptized, they're said to be added to the Lord. Hmm. Um, and I mean, I, I went through those proofs, those texts. I mean, it's a real um, uh, what, what, offering ceremony. What do you want to call it? It's it's yeah. like I now pronounce you man and wife. It's like you know, I declare you. You know, you've been lawfully taken your oath, and now the president of the United States. It's it's not it's not a drama dramatization of an abstract truth of something that happened or will happen or happens to some people or even happen to you. It, it's an actual, it's an actual ceremony of induction. Hmm. So okay. that, that, that's the first thing is I don't, I don't even see that category being in his, in his, on his horizon. Okay. And, and secondly, um, you know, we're told what it means. It means death to death to sin and life to Christ in Romans six. It means, 
I mean, it means a lot more than what he's saying. And I, I guess what I'm asking is, um, what did he say that circumcision? What, what did he say? Let's read that quote again. Here we go. Um, he says baptism's not it, well. He he's really speaking about baptism here. So he's, I think what he's okay. what he says earlier is that circumcision is a sign, um, you know, of of physi of uh, of physical descent, um, and it's a sign that is anticipating what's going to be happening uh, in the in the gospel as well. See, I don't think the circumcision is a sign of physical descent. It's physical descendants are supposed to receive the sign. Oh, okay. I, don't, I mean, I mean, I don't. I mean, in fact, I mean, it seems to be. Look, circumcision represents emasculation. I wouldn't. I would say it almost re, almost represents a cutting off of physical descent. Um, I realize it's inherited. It was from the nation. The nation of Abraham was supposed to be circumcised, but in so doing, they were. That's why it's so ridiculous to boast in circumcision. It represents mutilation. It represents castration. I mean, it's. It represents. I'm sorry. Was this supposed to be a family <laughs> family yeah, interview? I think we're okay. Sorry. Anyway, I think we're okay. Hopefully, we're okay. That's about all I have to say about that. Anyway, um, you know, I honestly, it just seems like it's so completely confined to Baptistic type assumptions. I can't even get my mind around that. I don't know why he reads the Bible and frames the question that way. Okay. So it would take a lot longer to really get sure. into details. I need to talk to him some. But no, I think it's good. I think it's good. All right. Um, yeah, no, you know, in, in preparing for this interview, I, you know, we tried to get some feedback from people <clears throat> in terms of, you know, questions that, uh, that they felt would be good to, to ask. And I know one Reformed Baptist in, in particular, um, he pointed out a little argument from, um, <clears throat> from Thomas Schreiner, professor of New Testament at Southern Baptist, uh, in his, his newest commentary on, on Galatians, um, you know, I'm just going to sum it up. There's a huge quote that you know is the background to this, so maybe I'll post it in the <clears throat> in the uh, in the info section of of this. But essentially, he was he was saying that if if baptism replaced circumcision, like Pado Baptist said it did, then then Paul's argument in Galatians would have been you know much easier. It would have been like a, a three or four line um, you know letter, um, and he most certainly would have used that um, if if you know, if, if he had believed that it would have been a much, much easier argument, um, to make. So, you know, what, what do you think of this? I know I've, you know, I've, I've sent you the quote. I'll First of all, up later. we constantly, we constantly oversimplify Paul and we really ought to take, get a grip on how complicated his arguments are because he needs them to be. That's, that's something I'm doing something with Romans right now. And, um, I, I can relate to the problem, but he's mis he's misapplied the issue. Uh, because as far as I'm concerned, that, that few, that little paragraph is in Galatians. I mean, this is how I read it. Um, uh, starting with, uh, 323. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law is our guardian until Christ came, in order that we may, might be justified by faith. Now that the faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is. He goes on. I was going to read more than that, but yeah. I mean, I, I that is it. That's it. That's exactly what he says. Is what Paul would use. I, I, that's how I read it. I don't understand why anyone would read it any other way. Hmm. Now, of course, I'm sure if you get his commentary in Galatians, he does read it some other way, and yeah, that's you know, I need to respond to that. But I mean, I to me, it's actually what he's the smoking gun he's looking for is right there, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Interesting. Now, there's, there, it's true that Paul's got more concerns than that, and yeah. We could talk about why that is. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very. It's very good. He notices that, but um, it's, it's not the, the, the arguments there. Hmm. The one he's saying that ought to be there. Okay. If, if Peter Baptist was true. Okay, good. Um, let's do one. Let's do another one. Um, I noticed on on page uh, twenty three of your book. Um, you know, really, um, really popular argument for for Pado Baptism. You know, looking at Acts two thirty nine. Uh, to show that the Apostle Peter believed that God's uh, new covenant still involved uh, promises to our, our children. It says, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord called to himself. Now, I, I was just listening to a debate between um, an OPC guy, Bill Shishko, and uh, Reformed Baptist extraordinaire James White on baptism. And James White, I think Bill Shishko mentioned Acts 2.39, and, and James White responded to the text by pointing out that uh, he thinks that the last clause qualifies everything in the first clause. So everyone whom the Lord called to himself, that's how you interpret the first uh, three groups. And, and White sees this as referring to 
uh, effectual calling. Um, so I guess for him, the verse would read, you know, for the promises for you, the elect, your children, the elect, and all the elect who are, are, are far off. So, I mean, do you think this works? Does this undermine uh, Acts 2.39 as, as one of our, our proof texts? So uh, Peter is referring to a crowd of people who haven't converted yet, and he's singling out the elect by the first person plural. That's yeah, interesting okay. by itself. Um, right. No, I think it's the promises for, I mean, let's, where is it here? Um, <clears throat> all right, let's see. Okay, for the promises for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, and everyone who the Lord will call them their children. So you can split up a different way. Right. Um, but you and your children. And besides that, look, look at all this argument that was arguing that's going over circumcision. You're telling me that we just simply rip the children out of the covenant and this doesn't require any explanation in any epistle whatsoever? Right, okay. Right. Yeah, like this you know, we this got, would we have been an nothing. issue. Yeah. This would have been an issue we got for these Jewish Christians. Thunderbolts from Peter, this complete revolution that's never commented on again. Right. I, right. I don't see it. Okay. Uh, so. Okay. All right. Now, one of the things that we had done on the uh, on the blog uh, was we had asked, um, you know, if, if people had any questions for you, and uh, one one of our readers chimed in and asked um, and asked this question. I thought it was interesting. It may not speak to your context. It it does speak to our context in in Toronto. Um, <clears throat> Why is it that uh, that many churches that practice uh, credo baptism or believers baptism just seem to be more energetic and uh, and engaged? And uh, he's he's probably referring to this you know young restless reform movement, which seems to be largely uh, believer uh, you know a movement of reformed um, Baptist folk. Um, although there are Presbyterians in the mix. So uh, this person wanted to know, is this just an accident of, of history, or is there something about believers' baptism that just seems to fire people up? I um, thought it was an interesting question, so we thought we'd ask that to you. What do you think? Well, I think a lot of people are becoming Calvinists and getting fired up about that and fired up about evangelism, and they're already Baptists. I don't think um, Cato baptism would affect that one way or the other. Hmm. Um, I imagine, you know, they're all going to eventually learn to be fired up about pedobatism too, and then they're all going to be fired up about that, and we'll have a bunch of empirical evidence going the other way. But, you know, as, I think I think I'd really have to say, it's just, it's hard to make a, a real deduction from that kind of thing. Um, I've seen other things happen, <coughs> and I also know that I've been parts of things where people were fired up for stuff that I thought was ridiculous, and, um, and not, not pedobatism, by the way, yeah, I'm not yeah. saying that, I'm talking about I think things that you and I would agree are ridiculous. Um, right. So, you know, the people that, that think that, you know, talking like animals in the name of the Spirit is somehow yeah. sanctifying, or yeah. they, they'll say they're fired up. I, I mean, you know, it's just I don't want to, to bash anyone because people do get fired up who aren't who aren't paid baptists like me, and but I think paid baptists get fired up too, and, and there's just too many things in history to for me to feel either too threatened by that or to even want to refute it per se. I just, I just, um, I don't want anyone to lose their fervor, but I, I want people to be excited about that the, the God's put his church in history and he's included our children in it. Excellent. Okay. All right. So last question, Mark. Um, um, if you were to equip Pado Baptist, so let's say there's a Pado Baptist listening to this presentation and you wanted to equip them with an argument to go on the offensive against um, believers Baptist, like let's say they're, you know, they're, they're just taking it from all sides and, and they want to go on the uh, offensive and and, uh, and launch an argument. I mean, where would you go? What would you say? Well, I mean, you know, hopefully my book's a little bit of an answer to that. But yeah. really, I mean, to, to, to do a kind of a, you know, a judo move or whatever, a, uh, an evasion, and I, w I would say that, or to give a new argument to an old, to a traditional position, I would really want to hit on... Um, one, what is the church, and two, what is baptism? I, I, I mean, I feel like in a sense we, we, we know that's part of the answer to this question, but we haven't really talked about it directly, and those would almost be two different kinds of, um, you know, interviews to do. I mean, sure. they're topics to themselves, but, you know, is baptism a representation of an abstract truth? Is it a reminder and traumatization of an autobiographical fact, or is it actually an entrance ceremony? Hmm. Um is the church an after an after effect, like an epiphenomenon of believers? Is it a collection of believers that 
has no prior existence, or is it more like a nation state, or like a corporation, or like a, a family? Um, is the church a real historical um, force on earth? You see, if you see the church as an objective institution, and then baptism as that, that kind of boundary mark, sure. um, it gives you a whole new perspective on how to, how to look at... It opens up the possibility of paleo baptism without which I don't think beta baptism makes much sense. So I don't think baptism itself makes much sense, to be honest with you. I mean, in fact, you know, my counter evidence would be things like I, I keep finding you know, Baptists who've been raised to basically get baptized over and over again. Right. Yeah. Uh, what's up with that? But yeah. then again, I guess you have to be truly converted, and that's a big question in your mind. And I guess you have to have as many baptisms as you do reconversions. Or and, yeah. and then you know you find a missionary who um you know was in like South Africa somewhere, and this is a true story by the way. You know yeah. decided that since there wasn't any good pool of water to do immersion, decided to use sand for baptism because that's really close to what Paul meant in Romans six anyway, right? So you have people who are insisting on immersion and baptism who don't even use water. Now what's up with that? No, okay, I wouldn't. I'm not going to impose that on all uh, credo Baptists, but I, I, I don't find much. I, I think the orbit of symbolism and the extrapolations there from get pretty crazy. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, and I think I think that's because we're 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 missing something in this entire sacramental kind of um, symbolic um, uh, uh, the data that we have in the Bible. Okay. and how that should work and what it applies to. So. Okay, that's awesome. All right, Mark, well, thank you so much for your time. All right, and I'll just...